Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello and welcome to And Now for Something Completely Machinima, the podcast about machinima, virtual production and related technologies. My name is Phil Rice, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Tracy Harwood, Ricky Grove, and Damian Valentine. Hello. Hello. This uh, week, we are discussing a feature-length film, which is is certainly not the first that's been done, but it is a rarity in the world of, of machinima, and even in, in virtual production. Um, and uh, this one has some some... Uh, interesting elements to it and some really nice production values, I thought. But Tracy, why don't you, uh, it's your pick, so why don't you uh, tell us about this film? Absolutely. Well, Emesis Blue, it's a source filmmaker um, by Fortress Films, uh, and it was actually released um, February last year. Um, It's an astonishing one hour and 50 minutes long. It's, as you said, Phil, it's a length we've rarely seen reviewed, uh, rarely, rarely seen, and certainly um, more, or le- more or less, I think we've probably only reviewed one other feature-length uh, film that probably didn't go down too well, as I recall. Um, I guess our um, challenge with with what we what we see with these films mostly is that um, because because we are mostly um, concerned with uh, with short machinima, um, we never really tend to get into the long. The longer forms. Um, however, when I started watching this, it immediately kind of um, hooked me, uh, and I thought, well, it's time we took a, a look at a longer form one, see what see what we all think of it. Um, so, Amesis Blue, um, Team Fortress Two. It's a psychological horror machinima. It's been created by Chad Payne as writer and director, and Anton Pelizari, who is the producer of it. Uh, and these guys work together as Fortress Films. Um, Chad wrote this apparently over five years, basing the story on the characters um, which are um, you know, basically created by Valve. They said that as their, the, their, the viewership of their channel grew, they became inspired to increase the quality of their videos, um, which is why they ended up creating this feature-length animation. Um, and at the same time, they expanded their production team um, to make it. Since the release of this film, it's received a huge amount of attention, uh, mostly positive from the game's fan community. So it's probably fair to say they are uh, uh, well on their way, I think, to achieving their goal. It's had over 9 million views so far. Um, The plot's basically this. Uh, And bear with me on the detail, because the detail is is an interesting aspect of this. Um, So they've described it as on Halloween night of 1968, a high ranking executive of the Builders League United Corporation mysteriously vanishes in Mortem, New Mexico. A private detective and a washed up war veteran team up to find him, yet the man they hunt is more dangerous than they can possibly imagine. At the same time, the patient of a local doctor is abducted from his home, his mother having been brutally murdered by an unknown assailant. The doctor searches for him on his own, only to find himself caught up in a conspiracy that he may or may not be involved with. And when their paths cross, terror and death ensue, brought about by a horror that challenges the sanity and true natures of the characters involved. Now, that's pretty close, I thought, to to what I actually saw in the film, which is why I thought I might as well use what they've uh, described it as. As I said, I love the way this starts um, and the interaction between the characters, which you become invested in really quite quickly. But you do kind of lose the sense of who they are during the film, which I became to realise was actually quite deliberate. There's a, a corrupt politician who runs... Um, a soldier recycling facility and an hallucinogenic drug that's being used in some capacity. The doc is revealed as a psychopath. There are zombies in the facility leading to 
Tarantino-esque standoffs with blood everywhere, quite a lot of fire and the occasional burst of classical music. And then these recycled soldiers are revealed as Frankenstein-like creatures. It's actually really complex uh, and it's only about halfway through that I felt I was getting the measure of what was going on. I began to realise it has to do with this malfunctioning uh, respawn machine, which is being used to create these super soldiers who can be traded as commodities by the company and who are enlivened with this drug, which is branded Emesis. And the characters in their various roles as kind of friends and associates of employees of the company are all kind of caught up in this somehow malfunctioning portal, um, which appears, appears to be kind of creating and recreating their alter egos in um, what appears to be some kind of recursive cycle. So I think quite cleverly, um, the plot is actually not linear, or at least the narratives between the characters are interwoven through what appears to be a, a time lapse or, or maybe a tear in the space time continuum that they've devised for this. Um, the way it's presented and the way in which the plot reveals itself um, is, is quite masterful, I think. It's actually pretty horrific, um, not least because it's also quite uniquely grounded in the Team Fortress lore. Got to admit, I did get a bit exhausted with it about three quarters of the way through. And, and it's the sort of thing you need to pay really close attention to because there are an awful lot of details in it. And many of them do tie back to the story somehow. And in the end, I wasn't really too sure if all the tropes and twists and, and turns made it quite messy, you know, sort of a messy tale, or whether that really enhanced the kind of suspense um, that you, you felt um, through it. I guess you're going to have something to say about that in a minute. Um, the ambience throughout the film I thought was intense. Um, the sound design drew you into the scenes. I thought in terms of the edit, um, there was really great use of lighting. The red and blue colours and the darkness of the shadows um, were really well used. Um, but I think for me, it was the sound design that was exceptional for me. Um, there was also some use of uh, lower and higher polygon characters and props um, th throughout it, really. Um, but by the end, I wasn't really sure how they were supposed to relate to one, one another because there were so many switches between versions of characters. It was quite a challenge for me to keep up with it. Voice acting, I thought, was superb. There was a, a surprising amount of humour in it, which I, I I thought was well done. There's this um, early scene uh, where the soldier reacts to a skeleton in corner, which kind of made me laugh out loud. And also a reference to Lieutenant Columbo, which I thought was pretty funny as well. Um, now, what interested me as well, given that we know how difficult this tool set is to use, is Fortress Films' comments about their commitment to using Source Filmmaker. They um, basically say they want to become the preeminent creators in the engine. Well, I, I certainly think they've achieved a, le a level of no notoriety with it, um, with this particular film. I was super interested to see that there are many articles commenting, and not least because of its complexity, um, which makes parts of the film quite ambiguous. And as a consequence, a lot of what you see in those um discussion for uh, is um, is a kind of, you know, a critique or a questioning of what's going on in the film, which in some ways I thought was a brilliant um, community making device that they'd kind of come up with. Um, now, I was thinking, could this be made in un Unreal? Um, uh, and I think possibly at a production level it could have been. But I definitely think if they if they had have done that, Team Fortressness would certainly have uh, been lost in the process. So I think overall, probably it could only have been made in the way that it has been. Uh, could it have been shorter? Well, probably. Um, could it be more um, overtly episodic? Undoubtedly it could. Uh, it is um, cut up into chapters. Um, so you have the choice of watching it in chunks if you want to. But I think these guys have also sat and thought quite carefully about the nature of binge watching too, um, which is a very interesting approach to making longer form machinima. I thought they were quite clever in how they'd gone about doing this. Um, so overall, despite the fact that I'm not a horror fan, as we all know, um, I was really enamoured with this particular 
machinima and i've got to confess i really enjoyed it um for a whole bunch of reasons um not just about the the film itself what did you think well tracy i have a question for you i didn't follow all of that plot can you repeat it please (laughs) <laughs> well i'm not sure i can it was oh oh well, oh, oh i see it's knitted I get it. it's knitted together i mean it's, it's i see knitted together knitted i think is a very how would i describe it yeah you've got central characters and then versions of those central characters who kind of come in various ways throughout the story, and you've got various plot lines unfolding at different times through the the whole thing. I mean, knitted is probably a very good way of describing it. All right. I was being facetious. I know you were. Thanks thanks for taking me seriously. (laughs) Go on, then. (laughs) Well, um, yeah, Ricky, go ahead. Sure. The most successful animated film in history is the lion king 2019 one hour and 54 minutes and you said this was 148 was it something like that yeah yeah um the lion king you get to watch on a big screen made by people a teams of people who do nothing but clean and organize and lay things out it's a rather original story that you can easily follow. The problem with this film, it was just far too complex. However, I must say that the first 20 minutes, I was beginning to think that I might be wrong, that machinima is not a long form medium for telling stories. But around that 20 minute mark, I started to get antsy and then things started to repeat themselves in similar kind of shots. And then I realized there isn't much depth to the shots. They're all flat for the most part. And despite the absolutely brilliant sound design, I agree with you, I just lost interest. And I skipped ahead and then skipped ahead, but you really can't do that. The only way to fully appreciate the film is to watch it from the beginning to end, which made me go back to your comment that an episodic version of this would have been much more interesting because you could have designed it to create suspense at the end of an episode so that you come back to the next episode, even if you're binge watching, it gives you a little impetus to jump into the next one. Having to watch it straight through does not give you that Mm -hmm. little boost that you need to jump into the next episode. I also found the plot, uh, in addition to being overly complex, to be very pulpy, uh, meaning that it uh, used a lot of pretty traditional pulp villain tropes and pulp plot tropes. Now, that isn't necessarily bad because there's a lot of pulp things that I like in books and in movies and things like that. But the problem, once again, is that using pulp tropes, almost all pulp short stories, pulp comics, pulp graphic novels, were all done using a short form. So once again, you have that lack of depth. So that by the time you get to a certain point in the film, many viewers just no longer care about the characters anymore because they're either so confused because they can't follow it or they're paying attention to something else like the way the shots are laid out or the technique of what's going on which is not the way for a really good film to to function you know i would like to see if there were statistics on the millions of people that viewed it how many of those people actually watched it from the beginning to the end? I suspect the amount would be drastically less than Mm. what the total view count is. However, that being said, there's much to admire in this film in terms of the way they crafted the characters, the way they worked on the, even the props, some of the props like the, at one point there was a handgun in a, 
in a uh, uh, in a inside of a car cubby hole there, and the handgun had wear along the butt. I mean, obviously they didn't design it. That's the way it is in the game. But the fact that they chose to do a shot that showed that, I thought was indicative of their desire to be detailed. And that is, I admire that a great deal in the film. The attention to detail, the willingness to to craft the scenes as best as they could. And you're right, the voice acting, for the most part, was really, really good. You reacted to the characters in ways that they wanted you to. There was sort of a snarky humor mm. oftentimes. And, and then when the violence came, I wouldn't say Tarantino, I would say Sam Peckinpah, oh, uh, yeah. which which Tarantino borrowed from. That's basically what he's good at is borrowing from other people. But that's a whole nother story. But anyway, that suddenly when you hit the violence that just that just pushed you back from the screen, which I thought was very effective. Mm. So overall, I liked it and I thought it was a really good choice and an interesting choice. I just couldn't deal with the length of it and found the story to be not as if you're going to have something long like that, you better have an original story. And it didn't it didn't do that. But but I'm really happy that I spent time watching it. And I hope this team continues uh, making films, hopefully films that are less than an hour and 54 minutes long or 48 minutes long. But I would really like to see them. Uh, do more stuff. They deserve to have a good audience. And those are my thoughts. Thank you. Really great sure. points as usual. Phil. Yeah, I I really uh I enjoyed this film. Um it it's interesting uh because Ricky, your point of comparison for uh to to the Lion King, um I hadn't thought about it. And yeah, when you when you hold those two up next to each other in terms of what they were out to achieve and how they delivered something easily, you know, more easily digestible and recognizable and that kind of thing. Yeah. It, it, it falls flat, but I, I think that probably the makers of this film are uh, very heavily influenced by the Christopher Nolan type of tradition. And the film I'm thinking of in particular is Tenet. Hmm. Oh. which is a film that will never be as successful as The Lion King uh, for all the reasons that this film is challenging to digest. I'm not saying that they're executing on the same level that, that he did with Tenet. They're not, clearly. I don't think they would claim that they are. But I think that's what they're reaching for in terms of... We've talked a lot on this show about ambiguity uh, and the role of it, and that it's not an inherently sinful thing to do. But if it's careless ambiguity, it, it can spoil things. And if it's thoughtful or planned ambiguity, uh, it can be done very artfully. And for some reason, this film really struck me as, as the latter category, as as there is there are unanswered questions for sure. And I don't know how, Tracy, you were talking about, are they being strategic with that in terms of, you know, it's something to talk about after, right? Yeah. Uh, People think that about Christopher Nolan's work all the time, mm -hmm. right? Is that why? Is he conscious of, as he's making these films, maybe even more so than, uh, oh, come on. Uh, who's, the, Ricky, who's who's the director of uh, Blue Velvet and... Uh, David, uh, David Lynch. Lynch. Yeah, yeah. So David Lynch, I feel like, He's on another planet in some ways, you know, that he's not doing things for the sake of the modern audience. He is just devoted to the art of what he's doing. And if you don't get it, tough beans, you know? Yeah. I think Christopher Nolan is a little bit more, he's employing a little bit more strategy in that regard of the audience, but it's not the same strategy that the writers and producers of The Lion King are uh, going for. You know, Good they're point. very, a, it's, a, it's a mass market thing. It is a very original story uh, and a very compelling story. But when you really, if you were to break that story down into components, there's a lot of 
they're not cliches, but they're they're uh, archetypes that 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 story is built from. Archetypes are that for a reason, you know. They're stories that get told again and again in so many different ways over a period of millennia, because there's something we need to learn from those stories, right. and people That's, recognize them immediately. Yes, oh. yeah. Even if they can't name them or know the origins, but yeah, they're familiar to us. It's almost in our DNA to to recognize those things. Right, right. That's why. That's why, you know, very, very old literature. I mean, some of the stories in in you know Genesis in the Bible. It's just they're purely archetypal stories, you know, and they and they 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 mean something. And you see those themes again. You know, Cain and Abel, that relationship and all the dynamics of that, just as an example. Um, so yeah, and I feel like that uh, that these guys aren't aren't tapping into that, and maybe they should, in some way. You know that that th those things are are nice pillars that help people relate. But anyway, I wasn't turned off by the complexity or the ambiguity, um, and I've I was surprised at my reaction to the length because honestly, when I first saw it. And Tracy, I think you even put a note there that's, you know, feature length, budget some time. And I'm just like, oh, God, <laughs> really? <laughs> you I know? had the same reaction. I had the exact same reaction. But honestly, what made me go, <laughs> okay, but this isn't just, you know, some guy on a blog saying, hey, watch this long. This is Tracy. She doesn't throw us garbage. So let's give this. And I'm so glad I did. I really dove into it. Uh, I did not watch it all in one setting, but that's not the film's fault. That's just. The nature of my time I, I i tend to digest even feature length films in parts just due to the constraints of 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 time uh free time is kind of in chunks for me so <laughs> but uh, i didn't mind the length of it um even though i didn't at all understand all the time what was going on and i don't know how much of that was because there was time between the the viewing sessions or if, if it is something structural to the film that's uh that's leaving those gaps or whatever um but yeah i've kind of and it made me realize i've kind of been my my uh view of long form content has has been changing i think we were all forced to reevaluate it a little bit during covid when we had a lot more time to watch stuff and and you know uh uh, the, the the film that I'm thinking of that I, I watched only just recently, like a week ago, was Scorsese's latest, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, which I'm not comparing this film to that in any way, because Killers of the Flower Moon is a freaking masterpiece. It, it really is. But it's long. It's like three and a half, almost, you know, it's more than three and a half hours long. Mm -hmm. Um. And I would have watched that in one setting if I could. Like, if I had the time, I would have done that because I could not stop watching. I was drawn in. And there are moments in that film where I didn't, I wasn't sure what was going on exactly. Because there's there's a section right in the middle in particular where there, it's almost a montage of different activity and stuff. And it's like, what the hell is even happening right now? You know, <laughs> it ends up bringing it all together and tying it together in the end. Um, but... I, I got to thinking about like because a lot of the criticism of that film has been its length, and some people are just like, "Oh, I'm not going to sit up for three and a half hours for a movie. I don't care if it's Scorsese or not." But those same people will sit down and watch a season of Breaking Bad over a period of a couple of days, or they'll watch a you know a British television series if it's the traditional six episode arc. That's the same length as Scorsese's movie, you know. So now he didn't break his movie up into chapters. So I don't, and it would have taken some effort to do so. There aren't any distinct lines, but you could divide that up into six parts and craft the suspense between and all that stuff if you wanted to. But in terms of overall length, it's essentially the length of a season of television of many shows. And we're consuming, people consume that. When you when you sit down to watch a show on Netflix, how often do you sit down and just go, well, let's just watch one episode of this. Okay, so maybe you intend that, but how often do you actually succeed at that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, truth yeah. telling! And, truth and the truth telling. is, is when it's a true serial, 
and not a situation comedy that that you know the constant reset every you yeah. know at the end of it things are back the way they were when it's a true serial you're watching a very long if you're watching, if you're watching a season of better call saul that's just a really long movie um or if they split the season in half it's two really long movies um i think the same is true for some of the star wars uh disney plus tv shows that have come out in the past few years and or and the mandalorian and stuff i mean the, the number of episodes and how long they are really those could be movies uh, they're just they've just split them up uh i think because they understand how consumption works of of this stuff right now so so the length didn't didn't bug me i think the thing i most appreciated about this and you guys have already mentioned the production strengths of it and you're right i agree completely the thing i most appreciated was i've played team fortress 2 i don't know maybe a total of two hours in my entire life and it was years and years and years ago i played it long enough to recognize the different character classes but like I don't have any investment. I don't even know if that game has any lore or anything that they're leaning on here. But what I appreciated was that didn't matter. Like I could have, I would have experienced this film in exactly the same way, even if I had never played Team Fortress 2. Really good point. Like it didn't, it did not rely on that. And yet I bet that there are some rewarding elements embedded in the film for people who are fans of the game. Because that's, that's their starting fan base for this, for sure. It's people who are going to just watch it because yep. it was made with that game yep. they love. That's a big part of the audience and very smart. But the cool thing is, is that I, I watched it and didn't feel left out or excluded or feel like, well, this was clearly just made for them. And a lot of films that we've seen are that way. Are that way, right, right. Yeah, they, they lean so much on the lore. They're narrow. That they forget to tell you stuff. A star wow. says... Yeah, Astartes is a great example. Yeah, fans of of that game uh, were capable of enjoying it on a whole other level than people who hadn't experienced the game. And that's fine if that's your aim. This clearly, I, I can't think that was accidental. This is effort was taken to give this a broader, a broader possible audience. And I think they succeeded in that. Um, I liked the feel of it. It kind of gave me a especially in the intro, uh, the first 15, 20 minutes, like a Cold War spy drama kind of feel. You ah, know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just wonderful. And the fact that it was set in 68, it's like, yeah, yeah. I'm th maybe I'm, that's the, maybe I'm that's the pulpy it. thing that I'm catching. I, I think it probably, that a lot of those elements probably are, Ricky. Yeah, it's this kind of, you know, behind the lines in East Berlin kind of, kind of atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I think the criticisms you guys have given are valid. Um, I do think that that there are some complexity issues with the film, but I I tend to think, to sum up, that they entered into that with their eyes open, that the guys who spent five years writing this, I think they knew that. I think they were inspired by, again, the Christopher Nolan tradition, where Christopher Nolan, when he puts out Tenet, he knows, yeah, not everybody's going to have the tolerance for this or the patience for this. And I'm okay with that because I want to tell this story anyway, and Good there's point. an audience for it, but it's not everybody. It's not the same audience that the Lion King or Forrest Gump or all these iconic, you know, uh, movies and mass market stories would reach. And I think it's okay. I think there's room in, in film for that. I think to it, like I said, to a degree, David Lynch is the same way. He's not making stuff for everybody. You know, he, he's making stuff that frankly is really hard to digest sometimes. Yeah. Well, I think filmmakers sometimes, because the project is so long, they're actually entertaining themselves. Yeah, not just not just the audience. You know what I mean? They're doing things that are fun for them to do. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's so. And uh, you know, there's a risk with that. Just like there's a risk with you know with some of the films that I make, some of the comedy that I do. Primarily, it's just something I think is funny that's not always going to mean that a whole bunch of people think it's funny too. <laughs> that's something you learn real fast, you know, the same is true for dramatic stories and for, yeah, for stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. 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 Um, um, yeah. I, 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 I respect that even though some of the stuff I probably missed or went over my head or, 
Um, I, you know, I, I think there were points when I was watching it, Ricky, where I kind of was ready to skip forward or whatever. And, uh, but I don't think that's on the film. I think that's, that's, that's me. That's an attention span problem for me. Um, that if I wanted to, I could, I could get more out of this film than I did. I think it's there. I think they put it in there. So, uh, yeah, I, I really, uh, I really liked it. And I think as machinima feature films go, I mean, the production value of this is, is really strong, really, really strong. Mm. Um, Christopher Nolan came to mind when I was watching this as well, because I actually watched a, an interview with him uh, a few weeks ago before I watched yeah. this. And you're right about his, he likes to add that ambiguity because he was saying that one of his early films, he showed it to a test audience and they had questions about um, what did the ending mean? So he said, well, my interpretation is, and then he, he said, and then afterwards, his Christopher's brother said, you can never say that again. Or never do that again because uh, now the audience that listened to that is going to think that is the definitive um, answer. And Chris and I said, if I said it's my interpretation, they, his brother said, no, that doesn't matter. They heard the director say this, that's what they're going to consider. And so he never explains um, those mysteries. That, unless it's important to the story, he likes to add that mystery to what's happened to give people a chance to something to think about and talk about afterwards. <laughs> Um, he said um, his films are an experience um, and something that he wants people to experience but not necessarily understand completely. And he enjoys um, knowing that people will watch it and then they're going to go away and start discussing it and trying to analyse it and come up with their own theories. And he doesn't want to read them. He doesn't want to know what they come up with because that adds to the mystery for the for the audience to do. And he doesn't want that to come back to him. Um, but yeah, you're right about that. And so this was kind of kind of the same thing. And it is a very complex story. I think they were inspired by Christopher Nolan's work, um, simply because of the complexity in it. And you know, was, like you, I thought this is kind of a spy story. I did not expect zombies to appear halfway through it. <laughs> <laughs> so when that, that kind of changed the whole tone of the film, uh, when she started getting the horror element into it. Um, but I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we haven't really discussed that many feature length films on here I've tried watching a few when I've been you know trying to make my pick and they're just not it's really hard to sit down and watch a feature length machinima yeah. so this is one of the best feature despite its flaws because it isn't a perfect yeah. film it's one of the best feature length films I've seen made with machinima so these people have obviously spent a lot of time developing this story and putting a lot of effort into it. And uh, Phil, I've actually played Team Fortress even less than you, and I didn't think that was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recognise the characters from seeing pictures of them, but I have no idea yeah. what their character classes are or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And you know, I've seen them in other <clears throat> Team Fortress films that we've looked at, but that's that's the extent of what I know about the game. And it doesn't matter. Um, and that, that, I think that's good. And obviously, I feel like, like you did, that fans of the game are going to get more out of it, but not in a way that hinders those of us who haven't. Yeah, that's um, a careful balance, isn't it? You know, yeah, I mean, it it's is really hard to do that. It's and I think that I think that they had, that they had success with that uh, as much as anything else about the film is treading that that line where it's not, you know, you, you veer too far one way, you insult the fan base of the game by acting like you're neglecting them but if you're the other way and you act, they they really i i feel like they walk that tightrope very very nicely yeah yeah um, completely yeah, so, agree there's so many tightropes in this <laughs> yeah 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 this is a team i think we should watch closely because they're obviously a very talented group and this is obviously okay we're going to see what they do next i think could be I very think interesting so. yeah um, yeah you know, i have to say that i i found myself while you guys were commenting, thinking that one of the problems with stopping your viewing of a feature length film and then chopping it up like I did is that you miss things. You don't have the same continuity that you would if you sat all the way through it. So it's a sort of Janus kind of situation where on one hand you stop because 
you're not as interested in it. But on the other hand, if you stayed interested in it, you'd probably get more out of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a hard... I'm, I'm sort of talking about my preferences. I wish... My preferences, I wish they had it short so that I could keep my interests sustained. But isn't, as Phil pointed out, isn't that more about me than the film? <laughs> It's really, maybe it's really, well, truly it's, ricky i think i think we've been conditioned also by the kind of content we've been exposed to with the show i mean how often have we in our searches for picks have how often have you stumbled upon something that's at or near feature length and you get a few minutes into it and it's just like i'm not going to see anything new here and you go ahead and jump ahead i mean that's that is the norm i think because there's a I mean, the craft of telling a feature length story is it's not easy. It's really hard. So I, I, I think that 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 expectation is not only excusable, but it, it may also point to that there's something they could have done better in the first 15 to 20 minutes of the film to keep you engaged, you know, because yeah. I mean, you're you, Ricky, you're an avid reader. You're a writer. You know, the craft of of filmmaking and storytelling. And if it didn't grip you, then honestly, the onus is on them. Even mm. if, even if the rest of us on the show here can't detect what is it, where did this film let it down in that regard? But right. I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's a, a flaw of how you approach the film. I think it's an indicator that there is something to be improved there, that mm. there's, there is a trick to, and it's not a chintzy trick, but it's, it, there is a trick to, giving people enough to go on early on in a feature length to, to have them put on their seatbelt and stay for the rest of the ride, you know? And so uh, clearly then something in this uh, wasn't quite there, which shouldn't be discouraging to the filmmakers. It should be exciting. They got yeah. close. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Got Closer close, than any think. other feature length machinima film I've ever seen. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I lasted 20 minutes before I started jumping. That's quite an accomplishment, even, even though it may not sound like that to the filmmakers. It is <laughs> right. Well, there's and there were some really great scenes in that in the open. The opening yeah. of the film is clearly the strongest. Oh, to, yeah. Fantastic. There were some opening. great scenes. Yeah. So yeah, it's 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 that's going to take some study, I think, on on it, assuming that they, like all of us, want to keep getting even better. I can't uh, get the impression they do though, because the amount of craft they put into this is something that they want to keep doing, and um, they're lucky using something like the Source Engine because it gives them a lot of control over yes. what they can do. If they try exactly. to make it, it's up with Halo or mm -hmm. something like that, um, you know, the exact same story but made with Halo. It wouldn't have worked because they're so limited by the Not a chance. choices and the animations available. We for example, the, out the, after five minutes. For example, the lip sync in the Source Engine, it's just fantastic. Hmm. What and and you know what? I think what happens is as a viewer when you watch this stuff, at least I do, if the lip sync is off in the first several lines or the first scene, I just go, it's bad lip sync. Whereas yeah. if it captures you, it can be poor later on, and you're still buying it because it sets the sets the uh, your mindset. And boy, was it great! Just great. So it allowed you to be able to look at the characters immediately as characters and not as cartoons. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the lipstick and the facial expression together. Um, yes. The possibilities yes. in this in this tool set are very uh, very high. And they executed really well in those in those areas. And it is, it's important. Because that's one of the things that if, if there's nothing else in a feature film, you gotta have somebody that you care about because that's who you're riding along with, you know? So there there has to be somebody that's a character that is engaging enough or characters that, that you want to keep seeing what happens to them yeah. to some degree. I th I think that's if we were to study a whole bunch of successful feature films, that's probably one of the one of the the you know slap your forehead dumb easy things right. to spot is right. the same yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and there were three this... in this weren't there there were three really defined characters and and the fourth the boy was indeed a, a sort of a close fourth if you like but the three central yeah. ones were were just very clear I thought yeah yep and great voice performance too as you as you yes. mentioned yeah terrific 
those things together to, all really work for it well. I have to say that I had a little flash while we were talking of being back at the machinima.com early era on the forums. I wouldn't have felt safe enough to say my real thoughts about this film in the forum because the Team Fortress 2 people would have just bashed me. It would have flamed me. So I am really happy to be here with you, my friends, who give me the safety to be able to say things that I think that I know may not be well received within the Team Fortress 2 community. Because <laughs> they don't want to hear some of the things that I've I said here, despite the fact that I admire this film, and I think you should see it, and we're going to watch more, we're going to follow this. So thank you guys for giving me the safety to be able to express my honest opinions. You're very if you well. remember, the, the, the gladiator arena of the machinima.com forums, that's where you and I met. Yes. I think some, yes. something happened to where we ended up Kind of that's right fighting on the same side of an issue of somebody <laughs> that's somebody. right yeah. i remember that yeah yeah now all those people oh. uh, they live in the youtube comments <laughs> <laughs> that's where they went if you ever miss <laughs> them the they reddit. go back to the yeah go about a page down in the youtube comments or or reddit um, yeah or yeah. reddit yeah flame wars and reddit the flame uh, wars but, are well established uh, now aren't they yeah <laughs> the but really are. good choice tracy Absolutely. despite my uh criticisms i'm really glad you chose it and i'm looking forward to seeing what this team comes up with next but but you know what just reflecting on what you guys were saying the first because i watched this twice all the way through twice um because wow. i yeah, well, the first time I did what you oh, guys... Oh, Tracy. I know. Well, 20 minutes in, I, I something must have happened and I, I decided to go and do something else. So it kept me for that first 20 minutes. And then it was three or four days later when I picked up and watched the rest. And I watched it um, and thought, I've missed loads. I can't get back into it. I don't know what, where where I've gone wrong with it. And then I had to sort of sit and watch it all again. So I cut out some time and made it my evening's film watch from beginning to end. But I got to about 20, 25 minutes into it the second time. And I realized that there was this kind of like muddle in the middle. Uh, and it was at that point that I thought, I, it's not that I hadn't remembered it. It's just that that's where it started to sort of crumble a little bit but my conclusion was because the way that they had crafted it i kind of felt it was deliberate it was almost like you know loading up the washing machine and then you know putting it on fast spin and then sort of seeing what you know what what's clean at the other end kind of thing <laughs> of the cycle yeah um, but do you want do you watch the washing machine for an hour often. And no minutes? i have to admit not often <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> but um yeah i just did i did watch it twice for that very reason because the detail was just it's so intense all the way through just keeping that level of tension up to it for an hour and 50 minutes it's a really hard ask actually yes there is yes even sure for is. um you know somebody that can do that <laughs> Well, well, yeah, look at great, Pix, Pix, really even great. Pixar has had really failures <laughs> in the recent years, and they're probably the best animating Ashram, animating company in the world. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. all of that said, it's really great to hear that you thought it was a, yep. a, a you know, pretty, pretty good machine. I, I thought, faults and all, I thought it was probably yep. one of the best ep, um, long form I'd ever seen. Me too. I do have to thank you, Tracy, for giving me the title of my autobiography, Muddle in the Middle. <laughs> yeah, Muddle in the Middle. Perfect. <laughs> so look for that book uh, on Amazon. Self-published. Uh, yeah, Ricky's self-published autobiography, Muddle in the Middle. Also, uh, if you're, uh, we, we would love to have your feedback. So uh, you can reach us at talk at completelymachinima.com. Or leave us a comment on YouTube or wherever else you see uh, us promoting the podcast here. You can also tune in to uh, Tracy's new YouTube channel, which is a faceless YouTube channel that is just 24-7 live stream 
of a washing, washing machine. machine. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's uh, great. With different cycles, to, though. That's right. We're trying yeah. to get her monetized so that uh, uh, she can, she can uh, you know, run some ads on that. So brilliant. Uh, thanks for tuning in to us. And uh, on thank you. Of, yeah. On behalf of myself and Tracy, Ricky, Damien, we will see you all next episode. Thanks. Bye. Abiento.